Journal note to self, dear reader, fall of the North Star. Erratic remnants of starlight sends uniform rooftops within a five block radius. Adjusting our lens further down into the scope of an urban city, outlines of humans mechanized by social structures disappear into a hole in the ground and are erased. Calibrating the audio reveals decompressing diesel brakes trudging up the upper west side, car engines idling even loud, Pepito selling the times across from the bodega. Location only matters because of conditions that create location. We discourse in dualism, operating under the assumption conditions run parallel, that space interrelates through distant memory. Langston and Gwendolyn, Neruda and Morejon, hear the echo on the overground railroad part, metaphor part, homage to Harriet, who would have freed more if they'd have known they were in bondage. Perhaps we can be new millennium Harriets, create renegade languages, rescuing status quo from language bondage as in them shackled and don't even know it. Traveling through black spat night, snaking around corners into new corners, refusing a final destination. Tenement seat through the train synthetic glass plane. 125th Street in block lettering, America appears over the left breastplate of a man in solid blue dress. Uniformity along the aisles, everybody facing north as if something unknown awaits. Amazing grace, the homeless man, the homeless man in the corner with his hand cup for change belts. How sweet the sound, no one hears, only the drone. Because Hook doesn't exist, 2009, Harlem, New York. Answer the phone at 10 p.m. Off the reserve, hello on a nebulous night filled with palace snow in Harlem. Respond with okay. Listen. Be attentive when you learn he died in the hill of gunfire at the intersection of Minnesota Avenue and East Capitol Streets in the nation's capital. After thinking that's fucked up, thank your old college roommate for calling. Ignore that he greeted you as Hook, the nickname you went by in the streets. Hang up. You can and can't believe the truth simultaneously. Write D-I-S-C-O in your leather journal. Maybe this will immortalize the image. You would never forget him, but you've already forgotten Hook. Before the, bur before the blackbirds echo bangs against your windowsill, wake up. Go directly to the mahogany desk between two windows. Sit in the brown swivel chair. Stare at the building opposite your building. Rearrange papers that don't need rearranging twice. Open your journal to the name written last night. Disco. Remember the adult detention centers. Five hours after that release, disco willing an ATM through your basement on a handcart. Out of the wall with metal chain and pickup truck here pool the money machine. He did that. This is your introduction. Turn on the computer. Type Theodore Blanford in the search box. Click the magnifying glass. Expect to be surprised even though you know what the results will bring. Don't be surprised when you scroll to Maryland double homicide suspect shot killed in D.C. One lone bird outside your window flies backwards at an indeterminate rate of speed while the world moves forward. The bird is red. Look for balance in the oddity. Note that double homicide is five syllables, five deliberate pauses before damn. Remember you knew the suspect shoot a killer. Suspend court in your imagination. Add four indeterminate words to formulate the phrase whole court in the streets. This is how he will die. Holding court in the streets, prophetic. After reading that the now deceased wife had wanted a divorce, deduced it was because of drugs. Visualize the wife and sister just before death in their devil wide. Try to make sense of the blood spilled on the carpet, the red is deafening scream. Wait for the buzz to stop buzzing because someone rang the wrong buzzer. There is always an echo after the buzzing. Even after the buzzes again, don't answer it. It is not for you. 
keep reading the online article, but more specifically the phrases forcible entry and protective order. Acknowledge that your friend was a suspect in his first wife's murder too, a dead body in the trunk. Two days later, while driving to school, the teacher calls short man because it takes that long to find someone to talk about traffic. Tell short man who is a barber and has 10 years of razor tucked behind his memory what happened. Agree in unison that prison would turn the brain into a hum. Agree in, again that prison taught you to be a better criminal though you both digress. Both of you understand the term anomaly. But it meant that disco was a composite of many men who never learned to be a man. You would then ask the question for the first time. Why? Return back home from New Haven before rush hour begins to bottleneck the Cross County Parkway. Dig through the closet for the first version of your memoir. Disco rolled a safe out of the department store. The first line of the paragraph read. Go to the next page where he loves to pull the trigger of a gun more than the torso of a woman. Flip to the page where he and his sister distribute lead bullets through the wind windshield and the impressions of circular holes when the discarded lead pierces the glass of swift. Pronounced. The body is a question mark. He tried to run over the wife with his truck and then threaten her with a claw hammer. She told the police. Ask yourself why this sign didn't signify violence. What theory would Ferdinand de Saussure classify this under? Put the manuscript back in the closet. Don't beat yourself up because you knew he was a killer and said nothing to nobody. Forget the double negative your mom would correct you on. And tell yourself it's nature versus nurture. Justify your silence in saying that the world you once lived in was filled with silence and mayhem. That is why they called you Hook. Don't block Audrey Lords. Your silence will not protect you from your mind. Pretend this is penance. Wake up the next morning. Go back to the computer. Press any key to erase the black screen. Ignore the blackbirds outside your window while telling yourself this is the last time. You need to forget. But before you do, one more search. Click inmate violent death in the news. A flood of black birds appears suspended in animation at the top right corner of the web page. Ignore them, but then don't. Tell yourself this is not karma, Edgar Allan Poe style. He did not want her to leave. She wanted him to go. Said he needed treatment. Think back to the 12-step literature that cautions about the 13th step. Sexual fraternization with people inside the circle. Feel confident in assuming that she was a recovering addict and understood addictive behavior. Two addicts don't make a right. Tell yourself this. Read about the interaction with police who failed to notice the inevitable. Admit the judicial system is failing to protect women. I am victim was tattooed on her forehead, yet she remained invisible to the patriarchs, the ones sworn to protect and serve. Ask yourself, does his death matter more than the victim's death? Convince yourself that race never stops running, that memory will eat your ass alive. Say I am a changed man, but no one will hear you. Get back in the bed, pull the covers over your face, remember the dream. Forget Hook, wake up tomorrow, and feel guilty again. Thank you for that. And so that was a piece I read from my first memoir. It's called Hook. Um, and it's really, we talk about incarceration of women, which is a, a, um, the most invisible within what I call the inside. Um, I don't necessarily subscribe to the notion of prison or ex-felon or convict, I don't, I don't necessarily believe in that shit uh, as language. Because I'm not an ex-anything, I'm not a felon, I'm just me. You know what I mean? Um, so I think it's interesting sometimes. However, I do get it when I'm in places like this. I have to I think, of, you know, I, I understand 
the things that I have, if I'm about that work, I have to be, put myself on display a little bit. So I had some negotiation, but it's my negotiation. And I determine the terms of when I, you know what I'm saying? So there's that too. Um, but this is um, a book, uh, it's epistolary. So it's, but it's basically half me, half a woman that was incarcerated named uh, L in Brooklyn Detention Center, the feds. Uh, and she was, she was deten detained for three years in the federal system. Um, and, we, and we shared letters back and forth. So this was actually my first memoir. And then a lot of the things that I kind of did in my life come to her in mail calls. So you actually read through her eyes. And the, the main reason I did this was because of the silence and the absence of women voices in this whole thing that we do, excuse me. Um, yeah, I mean, well, we just heard that. Right. So it's not a it's not a it's not hyper, it's not a hyperbole in that, you know, go to these spaces, the least represented at all times. So I think, you know, as, as I am an author, but I'm not vain enough not to understand, like my mission, what I'm doing with this language is to sort of like give people's voices too. so she's part of my memoir with that right there. So I'm going to read you a little bit from um, Dead Weight, which is my new one. Um, and it basically starts off with a conversation with Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man on, on Riverside in New York. And basically I'm talking to the protagonist because um, I'm, going, I'm riffing off John Edgar Wyman who says, you know, mine are characters in somebody else's melodrama. And so what I, I like to think about this whole thing sometimes is, is how we become protagonists in somebody else's melodrama. And so I'm thinking about the Invisible Man and the protagonist and how our lives intersect in very interesting and weird ways, you know what I mean, through time as black men, right? So there's that, but it's a long, it's a long meditation. So what I'm gonna do is gonna read you the beginning of it. And then I'm gonna flip to a section that sort of like gets at the heart of where I grew up, which is Alabama and Birmingham, a place which I really love and all these complications. I love that place because it's my home, first of all. But second of all, I, 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 like, I like it because people keep it real. You know who you're messing with. Up here, somebody can be so, just because the N-word doesn't live, doesn't, you don't hear it doesn't mean it doesn't live in the imagination. The people that are walking down the street is coming up before you, man. And I feel like I find it very interesting that people fail to recognize that one single thing. Feel me? Anyway. The protagonist in somebody else's melodrama. The ephemeral foliage to my left blocking the picturesque view from Riverside is outlined by hemp doll bane, hay scented ferns, and golden Alexanders. Before the riverbank's edge, Virginia bluebells faintly obscure the yellow water taxi sputtering southbound toward that section of lower Manhattan resembling an upside down middle finger burning the Hudson on the New York City map. 100 yards out over the river, seagulls pipe unpredictable trajectories in broken syntax, often suspending themselves mid-sentence, wading in the deaf cesura, then free-falling backwards into patterns of descriptive sign language. Two BMX riders with black bikes parallel and identical in pedal rotation rapidly approach before scuttling southbound on the walkway to a muted blur, unaware of their subtext of uniformity. At 139th vintage floodlights, though not lit, are pronounced erect and lined single file along the walkway. A mother haphazardly waves a wand of streaming bubbles while her trailing son and daughter play a game of catch and burst a bubble. Long before the game of life burst the innocuous state and reality smashes into them head on with the force of a Mack truck. There is serene music in the background. A loud congregation of finches invisible within the trees, their culmination, culminating voices singing in purple choral structures. Diesel engine buses join the melodious overtone with the stop and go of their compression brakes up and down Riverside. Because it is mandated by the New York City Parks Department to clean up after your dog, there are sporadic flashes of pooper scoopers bending down with plastic bags to retrieve animal waste deposited on the walkway. A few more steps up the steep incline is 145th Street 
and the official entrance to the Riverbank State Parkway is tall perforated metal sign bearing the park's name in bright red letters accented by the wrought iron gate painted green complete with the guard shack nearby. Then the view to the left bends back to the brackish blue water of the Hudson before opening onto a canopy of trees as if the impending stretch of walkway is the calm before the storm. Dust seems more than eager to descend on this East Coast island and headlights will soon stab the darkness while inching across the bridge into New Jersey. The smell of yesterday's rain is crystal in hell with each elongated stride along the walkway. At 150th Street, a small overshaped park has at its center a 15 foot high, 10 foot wide, centuries thick bronze sculpture by Elizabeth Catlett resting on a raised bed of grass. Carved out of the slab is a silhouette of a man who has no rib cage or flesh or veins. His insides are cut out. The silhouette holds his right hand up as if to say stop, while the left is anchored to the side as if providing balance against the turbulence the world is capable of inflicting, a sort of rudder. Next to the monument is the concrete marker inscribed with these words. I am an invisible man. I am invisible. Understand simply because people refuse to see me. Behold, Ralph Ellison's invisible man. The silhouette whom I should call cutout man could represent me in various stages of a complicated life, at times unescaped unable to escape the social pitfalls that have befallen a slew of black men, particularly in the eighties an era that seems so damn archaic now. The residual damage caused by drugs and long prison sentences, however, is ever presence. present. I take a seat on one of the curved benches nearby and study my doppelganger in amazement as spectator and spectacle, fanatical-like, thinking how easily the sculptor of this timeless character in somebody else's melodrama sequestered an unimaginable protagonist rendered real. The unauthorized biographer of, of ours, yes, mine and his life, trajectory, charted a path wrought with racism, deception, trickery, willful ambiguity, satire, and comedic relief alongside the theater of the absurd. We were only made aware of our line of society through an accidental point of view. That moment we were able to reverse the lens and peer into twisted eyes connected to a brain that dream a horrific fantasy for which there seems no immediate escape. Cut out man and I fell victim to a narrative that featured us as the tragedy, the sad sack, the bumbling idiot unable to control the thematic threads within our own storyline. We could not hear the hidden or silent dialogue that kept our daily existence simmering below the surface of the living. The only difference between us is that I was born not of the pen, but of the flesh. Blood courses through my veins and I'm filled with bone and sinew, yet my insides too are invisible as a cutout. I get up from my bench and position myself so that I am looking into cutout man's eyes before he can split the scene. On this day, we are alone in New York City, Hamilton Heights to be exact, a rarity in the city of millions. I have long held a burning desire to dialogue with this symbol of erasure about the madness that made both of us real. This is my opportunity. Although I'm talking to myself, I am talking to Cutout Man. Today, he will be my therapist. I can see straight through his body, clear across the Hudson to the Jersey shoreline. He is a pattern or a figure traced and cut from a human being, an outline within an outline. Let me switch a little bit to one of the sections. Um, okay, so I'm basically, I'm basically, so which to so the other part is you're going to catch me talking to him in mid, in mid in mid conversation because it's really long but I wanted to get this one in and it deals with the situation around James Baldwin's um that moment when you realize that we and all this in all this together um so here we go 
Although Brown and Board of Education was decided in 1954, so I'm talking to him now, right? We going through this whole dialogue. Some schools and districts waited until the early 1970s to, to desegregate. In Birmingham, Alabama, or that magic city, that glowing republic of Southern oligarchy, compliance came within waning hours in the fall of 72. This desegregation included integrating teachers, which brought me, the 10-year-old, to the emphatic statement about white people. My mother and I entered Gardendary Elementary as a social experiment of integration mandated by the court. And I was soon come to find out what it meant to be black. There is a wonderful video of James Baldwin debating William F. Buckley at Cambridge on the argument that the American dream has been achieved at the expense of the American Negro. The event was hosted by the Cambridge Union, a student debating society in 1965, four years after my birth at the segregated South Highlands Infirmary in Southside. There is a moment about 18 minutes into the video, and some of you may have seen this, where Baldwin articulates. In the case of the American Negro, born in that glittering republic, and in the moment you are born, since you don't know any better, every stick and stone and every face is white. And since you have not yet seen a mirror, you suppose that you are too. It comes as a great shock around the age of five or six or seven to discover that the flag to which you have pledged allegiance, along with everybody else, is not a pledge of allegiance to you. It comes as a great shock to discover that as Gary Cooper is killing off the Indians and you are rooting for Gary Cooper, that the Indians were you. The thing is cut out, man. Before my entry into Gardendale, every time I pledged allegiance in the classroom, it had been with kids who looked like me. Kids I learned to high five, dap up, and shoot marbles between shotgun houses with as we meandered into our teenage years. Did you know that Toni Morrison took the position that something was lost in segregation? The loss doesn't celebrate the division of racism produced, but what came out of that division? A way of going against the grain for the sake of self-survival. Taking the blackness forced upon you, the nigger that you became, and making it valuable, something to be studied, imitated, appropriated, and commodified within contemporary culture for the sake of modern art. Me and the kids I once pledged allegiance with were being conditioned to blindly pledge loyalty to a system we hadn't begun to understand, nor had that system pledged allegiance to us. There had been dynamite blasts, water hoses thrust upon the throngs, billy club beatings, dog bites, hangings, insurrections against humanity, and violence right in our own city, and yet we remain oblivious to our outer world of segregation, encapsulated in our own society of a perceived otherness. Maybe if we kids had been aware or if our parents had been more woke, we all would have revolted against this narrative or at least questioned this insane allegiance to society not yet fully committed to our best entrance. And yes, I would watch the old westerns with my father, cheering for the cowboys to do the Indians dirty. Even outside playing with my friends between the shotgun houses in Smithfield, I strutted a six-shooter cap gun full of a cowboy suit, thinking I could be the Lone Ranger when in actuality all I could ever hope to be was Tonto, a sidekick. What Baldwin knew, and I didn't, but was soon come to find out was that there is a terrifying moment within one system of reality, a moment that would contextualize race from which there is no return. True, you do become the thing to be hunted and treated like an animal. The trauma is difficult to retell. And remember, I begin slow, meek. Then it happened. Say what? I can't hear you. Speak a little louder. Cut out man is pushing the story out of my mouth. Don't hold back now. Get it out. Speak. I come back again with, then it happened. That's it. Now we talking. I continue with authority. The ball was up in the air and Michael Hallmark, my new, miss, my new best white friend, had thrown the spiral perfectly. And I was so fast, I thought I would jump high out of my PF flyers and then they were laced real tight. I wanted to jump high but couldn't jump high enough because the ball was selling too far for my fingertips to reach it. The ball hit a girl on her side. I picked the ball up. She kicked real hard. Call me nigger. Call me nigger. 
called me a nigga and I punched her in the mouth with my fist. Hard, red, appeared on her face. Red blood rolling down her white face. She started crying. I started laughing. I wanted to cry. She called me a nigga and I hit her real hard and it felt damn good. Let me be clear. Eunice Pearl Davis, now Horton, but daughter to Rosalie was never time out of standing in the corner type mother. My mother never hesitated to give teachers full authorization to paddle without parental consent when deemed necessary. Sorry. I have no memory of how I arrived at the principal's office to wait for punishment. Maybe it was the eerie silence surrounding the event because the teachers knew something I did not in terms of the history related to black boys and white women in the South. The memory of what transpired after my arrival is clear. Eunice Pearls comes into the office and says to the principal standing over me, do not lay one hand on him. Now when I say never, I mean never ever did Eunice Pearl utter those words in regard to punishment. I knew then, in this racialized moment, my response to an action was bigger than the act. But Baldwin knew that there would come a time and that time had arrived. It would take a few orbits around the sun for me to understand the enormous weight, the intensity of the primal scene that could have taken my life. Forget two years after the 11th grade day segregation from my mother, but then don't. How on September 15, 1963, a Sunday morning dynamite blast inside a church more four little girls into a forever memory. Forget Carol Denise McNair, but don't. Forget Adam A. Collins, but don't. Forget Cynthia Wesley, but, but don't. Forget Carol Robinson, but don't. And don't forget black boys. There's always a lineage of black boys to draw context from, too. There had been Virgil Ware sitting on the handlebars of his brother's bicycle who caught a bullet in the chest from a shooter riding shotgun on the back of a Confederate flag bearing motorbike. The end result, face down in a ditch. James Robinson, angered by the church bombing because he had already experienced a moment of race realization, gunned down two hours after the blast in an alley. And make no mistake, the police account matters more than the victim. The usual responses came after the fact. He lunged, reached, looked suspicious, made a move. They always flee. The police fired in the air, fired in self-defense because niggas be magical. Niggas hang themselves, by themselves, turn water into wine, slip out of handcuffs, be looking like every other nigga, do other niggas time in jail, reel and imagine, make freedom disappear in a finger snap, or turn it into a life sentence. Or worse yet, niggas get shot dead, and the world changes the television channel, unbothered, unfettered, and unmoved. My father, who left work with the ghost of Emmett Till on his mind when he got the call from Gardendale Elementary that I had hit a white girl with, years later admit he had to go. Had to. He had to because I was in a place that didn't want me, that said, hey, nigga, every day to discourage me from falling in love with their idea of beauty, their idea of truth, to never mistake blackness for whiteness in terms of privilege. The principal wanted integration, was part of a movement in Birmingham for equal education and access. Perhaps was a dreamer in believing that all men and women were created equal. In his dream, he saw the need to protect this little black boy from a fate all too clear for black boys who didn't stay in line. The parents wanted blood or neck and were not at all happy that little girl with blood coagulating on her face and lips got clocked in the mouth by a nigga. But neither was the black boy happy at being called a nigger, so we sat in the conundrum. In the end, the principal sided with his gut, the question being, what had I done wrong? What had I done wrong? My parents taught me not to hate. I did not call the girl trailer trash or any other derogatory terms I would come to know as an adult. Perhaps the principal had no choice if this social experiment was going to have the opportunity to work. But what about the below the surface narrative by those who often control the narrative, whispering in the parent's ear, you know, 
he can go missing. Done happened before. Turn up in the Coosa River with his face eaten by catfish. I would never know how close I came to being seen as sun up with my neck snapped at Callan Ingram Park hanging from a makeshift wooden cross. I would go back to school the next day like nothing happened. That big ass elephant no one wanted to acknowledge in the room still present and accounted for. The kids knew what, I, what had happened. I knew what had happened, yet no, not one of the adults wanted to talk about it openly. No one cared to ask me about the trauma of the moment. The fact that I hit a girl with all, when all my life I had been told that was the one thing to never ever do. After the accident, I didn't associate with the other kids in my class. I only wanted to get as far away from that racial madness as humanly possible because it became evident these people were incapable of being human. I never saw the girl again. Maybe her parents took her out of school unhappy at how white folks cared about the fate of black boys in Jefferson County. One thing I'm almost certain of and would love to confirm years later, the little white girl never called and wanted a nigga again. The next year, sixth grade, I was strolling to an all black Catholic school planted directly in the hood across the tracks in Titusville. Thank God. There would be bonding over stack hills and platforms, circular afros and braided cornrows. We drowned each other in cold switching language the way we say man and girl. We didn't run from our own skin. As a matter of fact, we ran into it head first. We were in a cocoon of blackness and whiteness had inverted to the other. They were the others now, and we called each other nigger, but it was love. Learning early in life to take what is given and turn it to something valued. I had left hell and returned to a mythological paradise, if only for a moment. And yet society would not care about the scars, the racial wounds bandaged up, but would expect me to forgive those who know damn well what they were doing. Y'all still with me? All right. Okay. Let's see what we at here. All right, I think it stopped right here. We're going to stop. Uh, let's do that. Um, I read one poem for a go. How about that? We talked about, I heard someone was talking about the, uh, the book situation. So I have a poem um, in here called Roxbury Correctional Book Club. Um, basically, it talks about the way we, you know, we treat books on the inside, and all of these um, to, are reference some kind of book um, that references incarceration. So the first one is in poetry, and I'm thinking about um, Robert Hayden. The second is memoir, Chester Himes. Um, the third one is fiction, um, Mitchell Jackson, Residue Years, and the fourth one is uh, Miguel Pinero. Short eyes, right? So here we go. And this is from 289128, which was my DOC number. Um, so I figured I would take it back and claim license over that. 289128, Property of the State, Roxbury Correctional Book Club, one, poetry. American Journal arrives in a library cart dog ear to page 18. The prisoner, as if to start here in media res, dear Hayden. The I in me no longer lives. It vanished, I confess. The collective we is no longer better, yes. Walls here are gray, not green, but know your poems sing. Again, I does not exist, comrade. I do between life and death. In this infinite space with no clock, no markers of no time, calendars to strike out the day or days, running together after lock-in, I write. The legal pad fills itself with regret. Ownership is mine even in this cage, a brokenness dictated by time's torture. Writs, habeas corpuses, motions denied, in a house lacking doorknobs to turn. Yes, the cockroach caught became a pet. At Christmas, my celly snorted white lines to escape physical torture of the mind, cascading in and on itself, rapid then slow, a program of abstinence and madness. Two, memoir for old school. Glove fist, flashlight, baton is fair. Entering the hole requires protocol, 
ears, mouth, gums, arms, lift and reach, bend over, spirit each butt cheek. Behold the still holding cage that kills. A metal mirror bolted the cinder block. Old school stares at the refracted image, age and natural antagonists of the young. Forgotten frown, brown face, a little boy once someone knew well decades before. Life before puberty, before adulthood. Every two years, hair turns grayer. A nigga gone with no redemption song, he would never know if change is real. Computer shop, religion, GED, college certificates, advocates, a degree non change, the quality of hurt. Old school is in the frame struggling. On good days, he reads Chester Himes. Words corroborating street heroics. How else to define antidotes of realism or the slow fatality of imprisonment? The sun cannot bear witness anymore. Forget rope, lethal injection, or gunshot. Fiction. Half wet, the cigarette half lit, a bugler roll up outside, walking the child, a fine mist picturesque and primeval. Almost halfway into rain and clothes, into baptismal, for sinners so believe in uniform guards lining the walkway. The residue years on loan from sale two came last night, the paperback version, bringing characters like Champ here inside a fool's dream or set up by subtraction. Too many pleas, illegal searches, guilty at the thought of life, though innocent, as the mirror shaded bureaucrats. Dreaming family, I draw wife, kid, dog in my head. Time measures mathematics that fail to reduce mandate to logic. Hidden in cells disguises change. The housing unit is an American critique on full display, cloaked in numb silence. There are no empty skeletons on wheels with limbs pulled apart by a team of horses. The body is now instrument, and tonight a book might save my life after locking. Drama. Anything can be destroyed. For the skeptics, trust. Donnie was deflowered one night after count time. Clearly the structure is obsolete, says Angela Davis, and I sit in darkness expected to write about injustice. A witness to nothing on the stand, but in op-eds I can be quite believable with the unimaginable. A report from cell 23, irony or ironical, I say truth, and what plainly is a corrupted condition, identical to the blueprint overlooked within the penal system, you can't see. The backdraft's flashpoint, a raging fire. This suicide must be. I must commit to killing the eye in order to save myself. There is no hope for the flower. Under the bolted middle door, it appears sometimes one act at a time. Short eyes. The dramatic play slid from cold cement, from cell to cell. Poet Miguel Pinheiro is one of a few. Whoever gave us prisoners, us, and I write. Society inverted. Imagine that concept. Color two, this violation is only the beginning of what you knew. Come sit in the political madness alongside the bad. Perception versus the real occurs quite quick. Or, of course, crimes against Donnie occurred quite frequently. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you. Okay, uh, thank you for that. I don't know how to follow that. Um, well, I guess I'll start with an introduction. My name is Richard Rivera. I am um, I'm the director of academic reentry at Cornell. I also do ethnographic work in Ithaca among the homeless population. I'm formerly incarcerated. I served 39 years in um, in a prison in New York State, obviously. Um, but um, I, this this whole uh, event has me thinking a lot about prisons. And um, for Colt's name was, was, is this working? I don't think it's working. I think it turned it off. Yeah, it's on. Turn it off. This one's on. It's a little closer. A little closer, like this close? Yeah. All right. Should, yeah, maybe. All right, so, 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 so for Colt's name was brought up a lot today. And, um, and I think he's rightly so. He's, um, he's instrumental for us to understand the disciplinary technologies and practices that uh, produce and reproduce uh, the subjectivities necessary for a hegemonic state. <clears throat> but when I think of prison, I think 
it is more an encounter with the absurd. So I think about Camus, I think about Sartre, Heidegger, Kierkegaard, because that is what it is, is an alien place where an individual is trying to find themselves. Uh, places that they don't understand, friendships that they don't know how to relate to. And in a lot of cases, this is what happens in prison, that struggle to try to find yourself and define yourself in an environment that's really hostile to you, right? Uh, and that's where our literature and our, and our creativity comes from. It's, it's informed and defined by our environment, the scarcity of the environment, the violence of the environment, the way the, the, the prison life is structured as a hierarchical uh, environment in which the individual with the greatest propensity for violence generally rules. Doesn't have to have an education, money, or anything. That doesn't matter in there. So sort of inverted hierarchy in prison where, um, yes, where those individuals are. But there are spaces that are created especially uh, for individuals in prison that are trying uh, to build their lives, and one of those is the classroom. I don't know if individuals that teach in prison know how important this space is for prisoners. A college classroom is a place where we go and we can leave the institutional life behind, the prison life behind, and where we could perform as scholars. And, and, and engage in a way that we feel will not be disciplined. And, and that is a tremendously incredible space. And, and a lot of times, in trying to articulate our experience in prison, we sort of, sort of um, dress it in codes or, or, or in scholarship in order to get the word out. And I think a lot of times that what we get is a filtered, fluffy kind of... Uh, representation of what prison life is like. And I wanted to make that point clear because uh, my own experience was was like that, was where I constantly struggled to try to understand my place in the world, who I was, and, and, and that was detrimental. And I was able to navigate my way through that with the help of others and, and some of the literature that brothers produced. Uh, I want to, there's this piece that was produced by Yale, uh, Dr. Doolittle, uh, uh, called Zoe, in which this individual, uh, Ivan Kilgore, who's a prisoner at, um, I think, California, and he writes about this experience, right? He says, allow me to introduce myself. He says, within these walls, I am socially, I'm a socially dead person whose existence has no legitimacy whatsoever. And this, I think this, this aptly describes the state that most prisoners find themselves in and why uh, finding ways of expressing ourselves through literature, art, poetry uh, is so essential to who we want to be and how we want to define ourselves. He says, this reduction takes place in language and culture typically beneath your conscious awareness. Like people, we get our, th we get our strings pulled by the forces and circumstances they create, meaning the disciplinary state. Uh, they have no legitimacy whatsoever, which is to say no self-respect and no sense of self-worth. Right? He goes on to say self-respect and a sense of self-worth is the innermost armament of our soul. It lies at the heart of our attempts to maintain humanness. To be deprived of it is to be dehumanized, to be cleaved from, cast below, Mankind, dignity, needless to say, is an essential, is essential to human life as water, food, and oxygen. Let me be clear: in prison, degradation can be as lethal as a bullet. And um, and I have witnessed this. I have witnessed individuals be so beat down, be so dehumanized. I mean, with these microaggressions and macroaggressions because um, there's a lot of beat down in prison too. Oh, in women's prison where hygienic products are used as ways to dehumanize women, denying them basic needs or making them beg for it or, or manipulating it in some way that the woman feels less than. And it's the same thing with toilet paper. Um, I went to uh, Kathy Bodine's memorial the other day and she wrote a piece, a poem, I wish I had it, uh, about toilet paper. Right? And I myself witnessed this happen. Uh, this guy used to take a lot of crap in prison, take crap from the prisoners, take crap from the COs, uh, be deprived of this, that, and the other. 
And one day we're quiet on the company, and he yells out to the CEO, I need some toilet paper. And the CEO denies him the toilet paper. You know, I'm not going to give it to you or whatever. And this guy just went on a rampage. He broke the sink. He broke the toilet. They made out of ceramic. He threw his bed around. He just snapped because of that simple and, and, and denial was the last straw. That's the most he could take. And um, after that, he just kind of became like a wild person. But, the, but it's in the indignities uh, uh, compounded that really make us question our value and who we are. And it is only through art, through literature, through writing, through encounters with people from higher educational programs or people that treat us like human beings, that create these special spaces for us that we rediscover our humanity. It is this practice uh, through academia that I believe leads brothers to survive this environment. Because it is, prison is about resistance. And education and writing and, and, and literature is a form of resistance in our way. It's a way for us to express ourselves, to give voices to ourselves, even if it's fiction. We always incorporate a lot of ourselves in it. Anybody who has taught in prison and has received an essay from anyone knows that a lot of that guy's personal life is involved in that paper. You know, he talks from firsthand experience because they want to be heard and spoken to. And, um, and I think that that is the form of, uh, of disturbing the status quo, right? What we do in prison through our educational programs is, is a way of disturbing this, is a way of this uh, gaining a little power where they have none. Uh, and a story of mine is uh, I spent a lot of time in the box. I don't know if you could tell, but I used to be like a wild guy. So I spent about 12 and a half years in the box. Now, in the box is punitive segregation. If, imagine it like this. So it's a place where a jail within a jail, I think somebody described it earlier. It was you, the jail within a jail. Yes, yes. And, um, and it is like that. You go in there, they take everything from you. As soon as you go in, they put you on a wall, make you face the wall and take every piece of clothing and hand it back. Then you bend over, scoop over and do all the indignities that they want. And they'll put you in a cell and you got three things going on. You got three meals a day. You got two showers a week. Within 72 hours, they're going to let you see your property to inventory, and they're going to give you legal work, uh, a pair of pants, a pair of socks, an underwear, a pair of slippers. That's it, 20 pictures and five books. That's it. And these are the things that are in the box they use to control you. This is what they control. They control you with your meals. They'll deny you this. My strategy when I go to the box is that I don't talk to anyone. I don't talk to the CO, I don't take the food, I don't do any of that. My go-to move was going on hunger strikes. So they'll put me in a cell and I'll just face the wall, the CO's right there, and they'll come, Mr. Rivera, uh, Rivera, you want your food? The nurse wants to see you. Do you want your property? And this will go on for 40 days. I'll go on like this for 40 days. And you think, what the hell is this guy doing there? And, um, and that is a way I think for me to gain power. And I'm gonna tell you how. Because in the box, everything runs repetitively, like a mechanical thing. The CEOs make the rounds when they're gonna make the rounds, they bring the food when they're gonna bring the food, the captain comes around once a week or twice a week or something like that. And during this period that I'm doing this, all this becomes disturbed. The CEO starts announcing, uh, South 16 is not taking his food, and he'll do this repetitively. The other prisoners start hearing, calling my name, and I won't answer. The captain will make more frequent rounds. The chaplain will end up there. The depth of security will end up there. About 20 days into, the pro into this protest, one CEO will come and say, Yo, I don't know why you're doing that, but I respect you, you know, because I, I drink water and I don't eat. And um, by the time I finish 40 days, I have to stop because they got a standing order to force feed you in 40 days in New York State. And um, last time I lost 68 pounds doing this. But by the time I finish, um, they don't mess with my showers. They don't mess with my food. They give me the property that, like they're supposed to give me. They don't disrespect prisoners next to me. I sort of created a space. I have disturbed the power dynamics in that place. I have gained a little power, but it's obviously none in a system of total domination. I think James Scott wrote a book called, an essay called The Power, uh, Weapons of the Weak. 
he doesn't mention the hunger strike, but Bobby Sands and Dumb Brothers and Iron did, and that's where I got the idea from. And these are the little forms of resistance that we could use sort of to disturb it, and writing is one of them. That was just a physical uh, anecdote about how, uh, how power is disturbed, but writing poetry is one of them. Speaking, asserting yourself, giving yourself a voice, or finding the medium for your voice is a really powerful, uh, uh, I think, tool to have in prison. And I think higher educational programs in prison uh, do this. And then we talk about the subject of this, which I want to bring it around, the subject of this, um, of this uh, symposium, imagination and incarceration. When I heard that, like you, I, I was struck by the singular of mine. Was it you? Somebody else mentioned the singular of mine. And, um, and I thought about, how come no one is speaking about what informs the prisoner's imagination? Right? And I think it is important to understand that the prisoner's imagination is informed by their environment, of course, by the cultural norms that are developed in there, by the economy, by the systems of what I call prison life. The environment in the yard where prisoners are making things happen in an environment that's defined by scarcity and violence. So they'll have nine way courts and 1,100 prisoners that want to work out. And prisoners will fight for those courts. Uh, they'll have only, as services, only 40 people allow in the room as services. So the other Christians or Muslims will have to waste somewhere else. So, so, where, where else. Only 10% of the population is what is prison rich. That means that they get regular packages and food and support from family. And they sort of become victims in, in a lot of sense or have to participate in the black market in some way because this is the way the system is. Um, and, um, and, but this informs us. So again, in the box, right? In the box, uh, we have 43 cells on the company. They got solid doors. And I have a cigarette in one cell. And this guy will have matches in 23 cell. There's no porters out. There's nothing happening. So what do we do? We, um, we take the toothpaste and we'll break it in half, put wet toilet paper in there, take our underwears, take the strings out, tie it to the thing and slide it under the door real fast and it'll travel like 15, 20 cells. And the guy will do the same thing over there and it'll happen, or fixing a hot pot with a nail clipper. I mean, the ingenuity and creativeness that this environment produces, uh, I think, works its way into the way we express ourselves creatively, expresses in our writing, in our codes that we switch. So when a writer writes from prison, he's actually speaking to two audiences. He's speaking to you in a way that you will understand. But I know what he means when he uses coded language. There's a difference there. And, um, and I, that, that got me thinking because of this, but it also got me thinking because the further I've moved away from prison, the more I've been thinking about it. And um, to end, I want to read a piece from Dwayne Betts. I want to honor Dwayne Betts. He's my boy. And he writes a piece here called Confession, which I think speaks to that f getting closer to the prison as you move further away. And, and I think it's important. All right, so it goes, um, <clears throat> I'm going to mess it up because I know I'm going to mess it up. So you don't report it back to him. <laughs> no, I'm going to tell him. I can give him a text <laughs> right from now. Just <laughs> 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 I got him on speed, though. Uh, <laughs> if I told her how often I thought of prison, she would walk out. She would walk out the door that leads just as much to madness as any home would desire. She would walk out and never return. My employers will call me a liar and fire me. My dreams are not all nightmares, <clears throat> but this history has turned my mind's landscape into a dragoon. Uh, I do not sing, have lied for so many months now that truth her bringers loss. Sleeping beside her when, my mem when a memory is holding me tight as she did before the lies turn everything into a battle. I once gasped and launched and tried to strangle the pillow she placed beneath my head, imagining me explaining that to her while still shivering with a panic and broken man, like a panic and broken man. I stopped believing in God long before then, but that night, when outside there was no light but darkness, I saw something of what, of what inedible is touched me. My children slept with their lights on. I walked into their still lit room. My son was asleep, and his brother 
draped over his body as if he were a pillow. The way he loved his brother was everything my time in the cell denied me. If I told my woman that she would want to know if I thought I deserve all that loss, her mother wonders why I won't let it go and holds on to the happiness and the life we have. But how do I explain that outside on nights like this is where I first learned just how violent I might be? That I think of prison because in all these years I still cannot pronounce the name of my victim. Done good, dog. <laughs> Done good. I'm going to give you kudos. Five yeah. stars on that. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely going to let me know. I guess, uh, if there's any questions, uh,